I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 4th of March, 2023, and this is my vlog of daily life in Nicaragua. <laughs> All right, before getting too much into today's video, there's something that I want to address that just came up in the news. So this is very time sensitive and I wanted to get this in. And that is there's a news article that's been going around for a little bit over a week, about probably about nine days at this point, that is talking about this girl who was at a hostel here in Nicaragua and uh, she got bitten by a cat, she got rabies, and she had to be flown to Miami and treated. Uh, and it, and it, she narrowly missed uh, an $89,000 uh, medical bill because of this and uh, this has been circulating um, uh, around the world uh, and is kind of the big news of Nicaragua this week and we just heard about it here last night and I did some research on this because I wanted to know because so it's important when, when you live in Nicaragua or when you're looking at Nicaragua um, you have to have a certain dubious eye towards news releases because let's say there are some questionable sources of news articles that tend to talk about Nicaragua. And so we have to be really careful uh, what we accept as being actual news, even when it comes from mainstream media, because uh, there's a lot of unsubstantiated information that gets repeated to the point where it's easy to believe it might be true. And even people coming here and seeing the country and realizing things aren't true have a tendency to repeat those things because they're considered so common uh, outside Nicaragua that no matter how obviously completely disconnected from reality they are when you come here, uh, people still repeat them. And so it becomes this mantra of things that is so untrue uh, in many cases. So this one I wanted to research a little bit um, because it had come up and um, when we found it initially, it had come up on, on MSN or MSNBC, one or the other, but one of the Microsoft-backed uh, news outlets that's generally uh, considered to be mainstream media and relatively uh, um, factual. And so I'm like, okay, okay. And then I looked it up and I found it at uh, you know a real British paper and I found it at the New York Post and not necessarily news art, uh, locations that I would I would go to, but ones that I would consider to be mainstream and, and generally fact-checked in most cases. So I did a bit of research and here's what I found consistently from all news sources. One, none of them did any journalistic work. It was all a repeat of an article done at a small paper in Australia. And I don't know if the one in Australia was a legitimate news service or not. It's not one that I was familiar with, but it was an Australian paper. It was not a wire service. This was not the Associated Press. This was not Reuters. This was not anyone with respectability. It was simply a smaller paper. And I don't know, a, a national paper, a small town paper, I don't know, in Australia ran this article. So nobody's putting anything behind it. They're just p picking up a cheap article from Australia and repeating it. And remember, this is just a story of a girl who got bit by a cat and got a, got a potentially large medical bill, but didn't actually get a large medical bill, which is worth noting. This was all she narrowly avoided a large medical bill. It's a very weird news article at, at the beginning, right? It, other news articles competing for Mindshare at the same time are things going on with royalty, the war in Ukraine, sh mass shootings in the United States, and then somehow a girl getting bit by a cat and not getting a large medical bill for it in, in Nicaragua somehow makes the fairly high in the news. This is that alone is incredibly awkward and makes no sense. Why is someone reporting about this? So I looked at the original Australian article and it's just a staff writer. And if you look carefully, his source isn't the person. His source isn't uh, anything that was, that was checked. His source was ad copy, for real, from the insurance company. That the, if, you, if you read the article, it read as ad copy. Okay, so this was very obviously why, so anybody who repeated this article and the place that, that printed it originally, this was an ad for an insurance company. And there's no uh, journalism at an ad agency, right? So this isn't a journalistic article. This isn't a news article. That, so this is fact, right? <clears throat> the fact is this is an ad copy for an insurance company about why you need insurance when traveling. 
It was then presented as Nicaragua has a rabies problem as a way to get attention for it. So, so that's the starting point. Then when you read the article carefully, here's what it actually says. A girl on vacation from Australia to Nicaragua, but they wouldn't say, so Nicaragua is a country. If you did this about England, you did this about Australia, you did this about the United States, and said she was in a place with rabies, you would say, whoa, 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 what place? Give me a city, give me a state, give me anything. Are we talking about a, a Caribbean island? Are we talking about the Pacific coast? Are we talking about a city? Are we talking about some, some little podunk town? Give us some context. No, there's no location given whatsoever. So we don't know what departmento, we don't know if it's mainland or island, we don't know anything. All we know is supposedly this girl was staying at a hostel, which is, could be anywhere, but they wouldn't name the hostel. There's no way to check up on this story. It is so ambiguous, so, so completely anonymous. And then they say she was petting the owner's cat. They have a picture of the girl and a picture of the cat. And she says, while petting the cat, uh, it, it bit her. Now, I know a lot of people are not familiar with cats, um, but cats, uh, including pet cats, including my cat, uh, if you pet them long enough, eventually they bite you something that cats do. It is a normal cat behavior. Some cats are more playful, some are more aggressive, some are stronger than they think, whatever. But at the end of the day, cats bite you if you play with them long enough. And I've had a lot of cats in my life and I've been bitten by a large number of cats. And being bitten by a playful house cat is not really a cause for alarm. It is generally good uh, to know um, the health of animals and stuff, but uh, this, is, this is just normal normal behavior. This is not a sick cat in any way. There's no indication of anything. The article then claimed that there was no way to know the rabies vaccine history of this pet cat. That alone seems unlikely, generally here, especially given that in Nicaragua, rabies shots are done door to door and are completely free. It's very unlikely for someone to have a, an unvaccinated cat and rabies while a risk here, same as it is in the United States, is, is relatively low. It's not, a, it's not a big thing. We don't go around worrying about rabies. The time that we worry most about it is if you come into contact with monkeys, not cats. And, and pet cats, very low. Uh, risk of rabies. Um, so the article then goes on to say that, that she was so concerned about being pet, uh, bitten by a pet cat. Keep in mind, people in the developed world where rabies is normal, outside of England, England does not have rabies, uh, were, are generally bitten by cats all day, all the time, and people do not go around going, I wonder if it has rabies, I'm really worried, what do I do? I'm going to call my embassy to talk about being bit by a cat. Those are not normal things. Right, so we're already talking about an article that is ad copy, that the basis for is BS, and then supposedly the Australian embassy implored this girl to get medical attention, because being bitten by a cat is so terrifying that, that it could could have rabies and they were unable to prove that it didn't have rabies i don't know how you prove something doesn't have rabies short of just killing the animal so uh you even you know it, it it's all absurd so then the article claims there is no rabies treatment in central america that's this is a very bold statement for a region that has pretty good health care that is a tourism uh health tourism destination we have uh really good hospitals throughout the region um and, and a lot of bad ones too right we're not a, a, a medical hot spot but we do have pretty good health care and things like rabies we generally can handle pretty well supposedly the entire region all six countries had no ability to to give her rabies treatments and there was no way to get her back to Australia uh, within the week time frame you have to treat rabies. Um, I'm not sure how it could be impossible to get her back to Australia in that period of time, but that's what their claim was. So she had to be flown to the United States, not Mexico, not Colombia, not any of the medical places, not in none of the places where good health care exists in the region. Instead, they flew her to the worst medical care in the region, to Miami, to an expensive U.S. city, right? So, so they're skipping much closer, much cheaper, much better healthcare, going to a place world famous for its absolutely train wreck of healthcare. They then claimed 
that the cost of a rabies shot was $20,000, that, that you had to have four of them. And then in different news articles, they had different amounts of money, $89,000, $60,000, it would jump around, and they would say, her insurance paid for her rabies treatment, um, but had it not, she would have been stuck with this $89,000 medical bill. They say this many times. Now, of course, a medical bill like that only exists in the United States. Um, there is no risk of a bill like that had she chosen treatment anywhere in the developed world, anywhere in the reasonable world, anywhere in the non-corrupt healthcare world, nowhere with good healthcare. None of those things would have been a risk. Would there have been money out of her pocket? Probably. Maybe hundreds of dollars, right? Um, but nothing compared to just the flight to the United States, let alone going to see medical in the United States. And so the entire purpose of the article was then to say, thank goodness she had this specific insurance, it protected her from this incredibly large bill. It's also what created that incredibly large bill. Supposedly, according to the article, the insurance sent her to this outrageously expensive uh, treatment in the United States. When I did a quick lookup of treatments of this, it should have been a few hundred dollars. Um, and I don't know if it required four. It certainly didn't require going to the United States or anything of the sort. And the cost of her insurance certainly cost more than a proper treatment would have been for this. So at the end of the day, here's what the article actually said. A traveling girl from Australia came to Nicaragua, supposedly. She supposedly stayed somewhere in Nicaragua, but could not, could not substantiate that claim. She was bitten by a cat, she claims. That cat was perfectly healthy. The girl then freaked out like a crazy person with massive hypochondria, flew to the worst possible healthcare location in the Western Hemisphere except maybe like Haiti, and I'm just guessing that Haiti's worse, got the most outrageously corrupt and expensive uh, health care that money could fathom, and then there was no indication of any reason for that treatment. A perfectly healthy cat bit a crazy Australian girl, and that's an insurance ad. That's what's being repeated in the news. So the degree to which there are, the you know, it's, it, it's being presented as sh this huge medical bill was created by this rabies-infected cat in Nicaragua. So it's, it's a very, oh, down with Nicaragua, and you've got to have travel insurance. You'll be, you'll be screwed without it article. And when you actually dig into it, there is, it's completely unsubstantiated. It was written by the insurance company, and the whole thing reads like an ad. And when you actually read the details, None of it makes medical sense, right? People get bitten by cats. It is a normal thing. Healthy cats will bite you if you pet them. Be aware that if you play with a cat, it will bite you eventually, right? It's, it's like skydiving. Sooner or later, your parachute's going to fail, right? Maybe not the first time, maybe not the first 10 times, but if you do it enough, you're gonna go face first into the ground. It's just, it's just a matter of time. If you pet cats, they're going to bite you eventually. Um, so I, w I wanted to address that because it is out there and if you're doing searches on things, um, it comes up and it is really easy when you see the articles to say, oh, the New York Post is saying that, you know, this girl was exposed to rabies and there was this huge treatment cost um, and, and thank goodness she had insurance, but that is not at all what it is. They're simply repeating someone who's repeating an ad who made a bunch of claims that allowed the reader to fill in the gaps. Right. There was no rabies involved. That was made up by the girl. Right. The fear of rabies is just her hypochondria. Right. Um, there was no need for the expensive treatment. Again, made up. There was no need for the insurance. Made up. And that's consistently. Every time someone says they need insurance, do the math. It never seems to work out. Right. Everyone says, oh, thank goodness I had insurance. Really? What would have happened if you didn't have insurance? Did you look into it? I bet it would have cost less than the cost of your insurance. Uh, and, you know, well, but the flight to the United States, yes, you wouldn't have done the flight to the United States. But the incredibly expensive treatment, yeah, you wouldn't have done that treatment. You're, you would have done it cheaply somewhere with good healthcare, right? Just there's so many things wrong with this. So I wanted to address that and I'm gonna put it in a short as well. So I really wanted to take a moment to get that out there and talk about that issue because uh, living here, living in a small place like this, the amount of misinformation, disinformation, the amount of fake news, the amount of propaganda that goes on to discourage people from traveling here, just to you know I know in this case it's primarily just an insurance company looking to make a quick buck by by stirring up some some fear uncertainty and doubt 
but the reality is is that that alone does not excuse why some more or less uh, respectable media outlets or formerly respectable or whatever uh, were willing to run such an obviously fake story and such an obviously useless story right what is what was the story right there's no story there there's nothing at all there's nothing to report girl bitten by cat made bad life choices right was she real no one no one knows was it no this is not news this is clearly ad copy and they were willing to just run it were they paid by the insurance company company to do that there's a good chance they weren't and it covered a lot of countries where they ran this news article. Why did they run that news article? Why did they run so many articles like this about where we are? Because th there's a big promotion uh, outside of the country to do this. There's a lot of people being pushed to provide uh, these fake outlets. And if, if there's someone like an insurance company willing to create this false narrative for their own commercial gains, then others will promote them being pushed to media outlets in order to get their own benefit out of it. So that's something I'm, I'm very concerned about because every person I talk to, and I'm about to lead into our story of the day, every person I talk to is, well, we were told all these things. And when I watch your channel, obviously they're, un they're untrue, right? But there's so many things that we're told about Nicaragua, about Central America, about Latin America, about whatever, people who speak Spanish. And they're so ridiculous, and they're, but they're so uniform. Right, the story from the United States, the story from Canada is so consistent and consistently false. And it's, but it's so overwhelming and they, and they do it through media outlets and they do it through the State Department website and they do it through all these different channels. It becomes very difficult for people who don't live down here to internalize that this truly is fake and to not believe it. And when you get told things like, oh, there's, oh, something's happened. I know normally it's safe, but nah, it's dangerous now. People go, whoa, must be. Why would they tell me otherwise? Because you were about to travel and now's their moment to act like and, and, and discourage travel, right? To, to harm the economy, to whatever it is they're trying to do. But one of the things we've, we've learned really clearly here, having been a world traveler um, and lived all over and traveled all over, one thing I learned quite some time ago is to ignore the information on the United States uh, State Department website. Not just because of where I live now, but all the places I went. Right, the information was was uniformly wrong. It sounded plausible, and they would have some details that I'm sure have some fact behind them. Oh, this neighborhood is good. This neighborhood is bad. I remember a number of years ago. Of course, clearly now there's quite a bit of danger traveling in Mexico, but still you can do a lot of Mexican travel safely. But don't be stupid. The problem is people who are reading the State Department website are universally going to be stupid because they're not thinking rationally they're going to a website that is known to provide false information and reading it thinking and this is just a life rule you can't use a lie to derive the truth but it is a temptation that humans really tend to give into we tend to think well all information this is and this is one of the lies this is a scam that people run they say all information is good information and that is absolutely not true only true information is good information right? False information does not help you. You cannot collect hundreds of lies and use that to derive the truth. It doesn't work that way. And so going to a source that is known to give misleading information, that is known to exist for the purpose of giving misleading information, not to protect American citizens abroad, but rather to control the flow of American citizens to places in such a way so that the United States can benefit from uh, bilateral trade, so that they can punish places that do not behave the way that they want or whatever. They don't have to create an embargo. They don't have to do something dramatic. They can simply issue a statement that makes their own citizens stop traveling. Not that they're forced to stop traveling, but they doubt that it's safe. They doubt that it's something they can do. And that is, that is, it's as simple as that. Right? And that power to control mathematically huge things is a difficult thing to give up. But you, as, as a viewer, as you as a traveler, all you have to do is opt out of that system. You don't have to voluntarily be tricked by that. Don't read the website. Don't go there and tempt yourself with false information. Right? There's no need to do that. You know it's false. You know they have an agenda. That agenda is not in your interest. It is not in the interest of people you care about. It is in the interest of whatever, someone else. It doesn't matter who it is, right? It just, it's not in your interest. Don't feed yourself 
that unhealthiness. Don't feed yourself that hate. Don't feed yourself that dishonesty. Don't feed yourself that trickery and you're gonna be that much better off. I gotta say, I'm just walking in this tree. I've never actually, one, realized what this tree is. For those who don't know, those are cashews. That is a cashew tree with ripe cashews right there. So this is a cashew apple uh, that it's forming there. So that's actually the fruit. And then the cashew nut, which is not a true nut, uh, is hanging off there. And you can't just pick them and eat them. Don't do that. They are very dangerous. You really got to know how to process them. Don't even play with them uh, with your bare hands, right? But this is this is a cashew tree going on right here. I, I've never actually walked up to a cashew tree before, and I just happen to have my own. I'm going to step on cashews here if I'm not careful. Uh, I'm going to get bitten by something if I'm not careful as well. Uh, I cannot get my screen to turn on. There we go. Oh, yeah, we got a good view of these cashews. How cool is that? It's pretty cool. All right. We have a lot of ripe fruit going on around here. We got sweet sop uh, that's just starting to fall off the trees and I'm about to show you mangoes. We got tons of mangoes hitting the ground. Uh, we've got a multiple mango trees and some of them are ripe and some of them are not. Uh, so the one in our backyard uh, needs another week or so and the one out here uh, is is littering the ground with mangoes. So we are in ripe fruit season and pretty soon we're hoping to have aguacate or avocado uh, as well. So my story for the day. Rick, who came down from Canada or came up from Costa Rica, depending on how you look at the situation, he's Canadian but has been in Costa Rica for a while, uh, has been wanting to come visit here and uh, has been a, a viewer of the show, as best as we can tell, about a year and a half, which puts, which puts him somewhere in the first 150 to 200 subscribers. So go check how many subscribers we have now, which is a lot more than that. And uh, so he's not just in the first 10%, he's in something like the first 5% uh, as of the time that we're making this video so back then uh, you know and if, if you never really like put in thought behind a YouTube channel pretty typically your first hundred subscribers or so is pretty much uh, you know family and friends people that you know um, if you have another account of your own if you have kids it's there like it's it's those things right there's always this base number like I know my dad's on there Mary's on there uh, Sean from back home my buddy Nate like whatever all, all Eric all my friends from childhood and stuff they subscribed when I'm like hey check it out I have a channel and they're like okay okay and they feel obligated right so they, you always have this, this first group of obligated people. My aunts, my uncles, I don't have grandparents anymore, but they would be in there. My kids are obligated to be on it, right? So that first hundred counts for nothing, right? They're just there to get the ball rolling. They're there to give you feedback. They're there to give you moral support. Um, but then that next hundred, depending on how big your friends and family circle is, that next hundred is where you start to actually get some subscribers and those are your early adopters the people who are just like oh check out this show that has nobody watching it right i'm gonna watch it and and participate and be part of this show and so if you look back somewhere around the 150 to 200 subscriber range i remember taking a moment on an episode and being like who is subscribing to this like i had made that leap from family and friends to clearly there are people i didn't know subscribing to the show and i was like what what is going on that's when i because I, I wasn't expecting to get subscribers and uh, that's when mary popped in and is like i'm always i've always been here right um but so rick is one of somewhere around that time period uh pretty much one year ago this week is when i did the uh fatima episode and the uh corinto episode back to back i had a weekend where i had a number of things going on and i did a number of trips uh and and a lot of walking and came up with a couple episodes that were just far and beyond other things that we had made. Now in January, so uh, 14 months ago, I had made the first episodes that kind of got attention. The first ones I really edited, the first ones I did anything fancy with, it was really basic, but I, I had taken the show to a slightly new level and we had moved to Leon instead of living on the beach. And that combination was like new things to show, new editing, it was kind of like a real show at that point. And we started getting that, that past the 200 mark. Um, so from January and February, we were gaining a little bit. And uh, so at that point, we knew that things were kind of working. We knew we were getting subscribers. We knew it was, it was sort of working. We didn't have thumbnails yet at that point. That would be later, we'd go back and, and add them. We didn't have music at that point. There's a lot of things we didn't have. And, um, 
and, and that weekend we had gotten enough that I starting to have conversations. So the very earliest people, like Jennifer Thorndike, jumped on and was like, hey, I'd really like it if you could tell me more about Fatima. And I'm like, I'm on it. So that was my first request and I went and walked to Fatima and filmed that neighborhood. And that got tons of views. And then we went to Corinto for the weekend, uh, the day after, because the, the Fatima day was a wedding. We went to the, the staff wedding. Then we went to uh, Corinto and Chinandega the next day. And people were like, new places? Awesome. And that had tons of views. Both of those episodes took the show and just launched it forward. And I remember one of the people that I was with when doing the, the, the Corinto episode stopped and said, 300 subscribers you hit 300 like that weekend he was like that's incredible 300 that's a real number right like that's a lot of people watching the show um and i was like wow yeah i guess it really is like i felt really good about it this week is the one year since the 300 and you can check how many subscribers we have now on the show but that was that was that so that's how long it's been and that kind of gives you a perspective on those early subscribers now i want to turn the camera around and show this is so first of all this this massive thing is the mango tree. <coughs> this is our big one. And you can see, I hope, like up here, like massive clumps of mangoes. Mango trees produce a lot of fruit. I would never have guessed that mango trees were so prolific in making fruit. And then here on the ground, this is all mangoes that have fallen. And this is, we're still early, right? These are the, the ones that ripened on the early side, the very first warnings that the mangoes are about to be ready. You can see things have been eating them. We definitely have the, uh, this, I'm sure this is the iguanas are coming out and uh, having a, a field day with some of these mangoes. They also eat them on the tree, so they don't necessarily have to come down here and eat them. Oh, we may be getting other animals as well, but we've got a lot of mangoes going on right here. So that's pretty cool. Um, we have just started uh, to be able to have our own um, mangoes off of our own trees for the first times. Uh, I'm looking forward to actually getting to, uh, you know, really eat our own mangoes. That's, that's just exciting. We've, uh, living in the house in Labo Rio for 2022, we had so many of our own limes. It was just having our own fruit was just this constant thing. Like, oh, we have so much fruit and we just got to eat it, eat it, eat it. And we use it for everything. So we've, we've kind of gotten used to, to how much fruit is being produced, but this is, this is a new level. And I missed this tree. I walked past it earlier and didn't notice this is another cashew tree. So this is just, there's so many cashews going on here. This is really cool. I wish that cashews were something you could just pick and eat and didn't require a whole bunch of processing and were not dangerous because that would be really neat to be able to just pick them. But you, you can't do that with cashews. Can't stress that enough. It, it does take quite a bit of work. So, so don't get excited. I'm not gonna do that. Um, but it's cool that we have cashew trees. I would never have been able to identify one. I had no clue what the tree looked like. I know the fruit and the, and the nut, but uh, not the uh, not the tree in any way, shape, or form. So that was very cool. Anyway, all that. Rick, one of our earliest subscribers, super cool. Uh, he's been looking forward uh, to coming and uh, getting to meet with us. So I wanted to point out real quickly this incredible story uh, with him. Kind of. So he came to. He's been in Costa Rica. He's been doing some touring around. He's been doing a lot of stuff. He's been down for a while, and then just came up to Nicaragua. I want to say a week ago. Uh, and on my, uh, the night before my birthday, he was in San Juan del Sur and he had this plan to come up to Leon, but had no idea how he's going to meet me because he's not commented on the show. So I don't have contact with him in the more general sense. Uh, it was, it was very much a, a going to be a surprise to me because I, I didn't really know. So, uh, he was in San Juan del Sur. He was at, I believe, La Republica, which is a bar that I do frequent when I'm down there, uh, which I'm not down there very often, but if you watch my episodes with Rachel and Alan from some time ago, and oh, I just gotta show, look at how many cashews are littering the ground here. The cashew apples mostly have disappeared. But the cashews themselves remain on the ground. That is really weird. Some of them just dry up, whatever. This is, the, it's just cashews everywhere. And I don't think things eat them because you, can't, you have to process them to be able to eat them. So. It's just, it's so interesting. This is all new for me, right? You're seeing, <laughs> this is me being surprised by my own. And of course we have coconuts, right? But I've had coconuts everywhere. That's not a, that's not a thing. It's not, it's not surprising. Um, so, so Rick is at this bar, La Republica. He's hanging out 
and, um, and and he runs into Josie Marr, who has been on the show and is uh, I talk about a bit. And they were hanging out and they were having drinks. And he's like, oh, oh, what are you doing going up to Leon? Uh, and, and Rick's like, well, I'm, I'm hoping to meet this vlogger, Scott Allen Miller. And Josie Marr's like, uh, do you mean my friend, Scott Allen Miller? And, and Rick's like, what? No, you don't know Scott Allen Miller. And Josie Marr pulls out his phone and has my picture in my WhatsApp. And is like, uh, this Scott Allen Miller? And Rick is like, what? How, how is this possible? How do you know this person and have him on your, like, know him, know him? Not just like, yeah, maybe you've heard of him, that even that, unlikely, right? Like, I have a lot of subscribers. I'm not, like, actually famous, right? Like, that's a joke that I'm famous. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so Josie Marr calls me on the spot. This is the night before my birthday. Uh, and, and the two of them talk to me and he's like, this is Rick and he's coming up to see you. And so he got my, so Rick got my WhatsApp and was able to contact me uh, and, and coordinate coming up. So uh, this evening, um, or, or late afternoon, I should say, well, mid afternoon, really, uh, Dominica and Paul and I went out and uh, attempted to meet up with Rick at El Sisteo. El Sisteo being the famous restaurant on the, the Central Park, the square in uh, Leon. Um, and actually it turned out that Rick was already there with his buddy Henry uh, and they were having drinks and hanging out there. So he's like, oh, that's great. I'll just stay where I am and, and show up when, when you can get here. So we did that uh, and we got out there, but just before we got there, um, they cranked up the music on the square because today is the Dia de las Mujeres. It is the uh, Women's Day here in Nicaragua. So of course, for every event, there's a big, huge thing going on in Central Park and they've got music set up. And of course, the speakers blast straight into El Sisteo. So El Sisteo was nice and quiet. They don't play loud music, but things play loud music into El Sisteo on a regular basis. And that's super annoying. No way to talk there, no way to, so we left um, and we said, well, where should we go? And we decided to go up to the Mirador, which is uh, nearby, uh, easy walk, but it is one of the old staple bars in town and it's up on the third story and has great views over the city skyline. You can see the sunset from up there. Uh, the, it is kind of loud, but it's not terribly loud uh, unless the sirens are going off. Um, and they have drinks and a little bit of food and stuff. So we went there and hung out. Uh, and, uh, and had a really nice time uh, hanging out for a while there uh, with Rick and Henry and uh, getting a chance to, to just chill. Um, and enjoy the afternoon. So we had a really nice time. Uh, and uh, it, it's always cool when, when fans of the show or subscribers come out and take time to uh, connect and everything. And uh, it's always very special, but, but Rick is a big fan. And being such an early subscriber is really weird for me. Most people who come out are like in the last three to maybe six months, right? And for someone who's been around for 18 months and knows all the things that has happened on the show, knows all the people, like he knew Dominica immediately and he's like, oh, Paul's here? Like, of course I know Paul from other episodes. And like the whole, the whole thing was really cool for Rick and for me. Um, very, very, very cool. So thank you to Rick for coming out. That was really special. And of course he bought us dinner and drinks and everything. Thank you for that as well. And uh, it was a really special afternoon. From there, uh, Dominica had places she had to go, but I actually had some time. So uh, Rick and Henry and I actually ended up going out to Mihuna's and hanging out for a little while. Um, I was like, hey, let's go do a real Nicaragua experience because uh, the Mirador, while good and a lot of Nicaraguans go there, is touristy in downtown. Mihuna sits just enough outside of downtown. It is completely a, a high-end, Towny bar slash club. So it's a little bit different experience, uh, but there's no tourists. You never see extra heroes in there which is nice. It's like a nicer place where you would easily see extra and Harrow's, uh, but there aren't any, it's all for locals. And it also gives you a feeling a lot more like a Managua club, uh, where you have that more uh, upscale clubby atmosphere without having to use extra and Harrow's foreigners uh, to supplement the income to make it make sense. There aren't too many of those in Leon. They do exist. La Avenida is another, um, but the, it's a nice place. We like going there to hang out. So we went to Mijuna's, had some sangria, had some beers, hung out for a while. And then when it got kind of late, about nine o'clock, so not super late, uh, I had to get going because I had to go to Sua uh, and hang out there and pick up uh, to-go food for, uh, for the girls because they were waiting at home and I was just getting takeout. And I could have gotten delivery, but then I would have had to beat the delivery home. And it's more expensive when you do delivery. Not a lot, not a lot, not a big deal, but I had to get the ride home anyway and so I wanted to save the money um, and they actually do a little bit better job when it's not going out on on Ugo or whatever so I ran to Sua sat there um, and got dinner and then brought it home 
uh, to the girls. And then once I got home, uh, the girls and I sat and watched the third and final Maze Runner movie uh, and completed that trilogy. That We've been working on that one for a while and we finally made it through it, uh, which was very cool. So it was a great day. Um, really awesome that Rick was able to come out and we got to meet Henry as well. Henry did not know the show, uh, but now does. And uh, uh, Rick is gonna be here for most of a week, so may see him again. Maybe we can get him on the show, we'll see. And uh, yeah, what an awesome day, so cool. Thanks Rick for coming out. Thanks for all the drinks and food and stuff. Uh, hope we get to see you again. Um, and uh, it was a cool day. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe if you'd like to support the, the show. Get down there, scroll down. It is buymeacoffee.com slash Miller, and you can donate directly to me and that helps pay for all the things uh, that make the show possible. And uh, as always, you can get down in the comments, let me know what you think about things. You wanna meet up when uh, you're gonna be in the area. You gotta work really hard to coordinate with me. I struggle to meet up. So many people are like, I'm gonna be in town this date or that date. I can't keep track of it. And people's schedules change so much. And my own changes so much. So I can't commit ahead of time and I can't track your schedules. I apologize ahead of time, but it's not feasible. You'll, you'll have to get with me on Instagram and let me know as you're getting closer and keep track of when, because I really do try to meet up with people. I love doing it. I have no way trying to blow anyone off, um, but it is very hard for me because people will tell me, I'm coming down in July. And then six months later, they'll be like, oh, I was there, I didn't run into you. And it's like, well, I can't track that you're gonna be here. And, and most of the people who say it end up coming some different date, week earlier, week later, whatever. For natural vacation, travel, whatever reasons, I understand, but I can't be on top of it there's, I mean, it, currently I've got like 30 different people who are attempting to do that. So please stay on top of the schedule, work that out with me. Um, give me enough warning that I'm not being surprised and being like, I gotta run out the house right now because I probably can't, I always have work, but with good planning, uh, it's often possible and I really do like meeting up with everyone. So uh, days like this are really fantastic. It's really meaningful because you know this takes so much of my time, so much of my life goes into making the show like it's it sometimes it, uh, I think you guys as subscribers or just casual viewers uh, feel like, oh, you know, taking time out of his schedule to do this. And it's not really, I mean, to some degree that's true, but it's, you remember, I'm putting in a huge amount of effort to make this show. This is not a casual thing. And so, uh, and I don't live in like New York City. It's not like I walk out the door and there's people who watch my show on every corner. It's not like that, right? People who are traveling from other countries to this country, sometimes because they watch this show, it's a really big deal. So I really enjoy meeting you guys as well. Like that's, it's a two-way thing. Um, so so don't feel like it's a, it's a big imposition. Uh, it is really meaningful for me as well. Uh, so yeah, get down in the comments. Talk about when you're coming to Leon. Talk about uh, rabies, vaccines, and cats, and, and all kinds of crazy stuff in healthcare. And uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit about healthcare in a few days here on the show. Just a real minor thing, uh, but but more information for you guys about healthcare here in Nicaragua. And as always, share on social media. Tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow. <laughs>